So this is this is an interesting talk. I'm the last talk before you get to go and play uh, crazy golf. Um, I I was last here in Swansea. Um, I was looking back in my records. I was last here in Swansea in 2001. So this was for a very different conference. I was at the Arts Hall at the other campus. This campus I don't think was built. Uh, research Software Engineering did not exist as a name. The Software Sustainability Institute did not exist. In fact, there is a likelihood that some of you in this audience did not exist. Um, and this is me showing my age. But what I wanted to do was kind of take a little look at what we've been doing in research software engineering over the last 11 years, and then look forward to what I think we could be doing in research software engineering. And kind of going from, uh, I, I sort of said in the abstract, going from the discussions about what an RSE is to how should research software engineering be doing things. Um, and so, as every good talk should have, it should have a structure. I should have some way of telling you up front that I'm going to be talking about a number of different things. And then I can deliberately confuse you by putting out slides that have no sense or meaning. And you're left trying to thread between all of the different narratives that you think I might be talking about. So I'm going to start by just putting out this, this little quote. And you're just going like, what does this mean? So um, I, I've been very lucky. I, I realized that when I've been looking back, um, I've lived in a time where we have had the introduction of um, what have we had. We've had the World Wide Web. Uh, we've had um, global positioning system satellites. We have had things like uh, TV remote controls that you don't have to have a wire on. I am actually quite old. Um, but one of the things that obviously has changed is what's happened uh, with this community, with research software engineering. So I thought the best way I could start this talk was by trying to see if I could go back in time to uh, where it all began. And thanks to the fact that Google still um, maintains um, Google Drive and Google Sheets and uh, the Internet Archive, I can go back in time and I can look at this and I can see where we were um, back in this sunny day in Oxford at Queen's College in 20, uh, 2012, where a very small group, you can see in the spreadsheet perhaps, that the discussion about research software engineering was not even the most popular parallel session on that afternoon. And you can go back and, and look at the people that were in the room. So that, this bottom right hand photo is the room. It is the room where that discussion happened. And there I am, I'm sitting in front of a lovely banner that uh, we've now lost somewhere in the SSI travels. Um, and yeah, I was in the room where it happened. And, and there were a few other people here that they are there. I see, I see Ilian, I see James, I see Rob, um, I see other Rob. Um, so clearly to become a research software engineer in those early days, you needed to be called Rob. Um, but but this is something that actually wasn't as interesting as it um, it really uh, seems when we look back in history. So this is this, these are the actual notes from this session. Uh, we had this policy here of emailing everything. So if you want to go and look and see what happened uh, in all of the discussion sessions in that conference, as long as Google does not sunset Google Groups, they are all there on the record. Um, and a lot of these things are really very similar to what we're talking about today. There's problems with not having good enough training. There's problems about representation, about career paths. So have we really moved on in these last 10 years? I think we have, and it's been because of people um, like you, people sitting in the audience, making sure that the discussion is always happening, always taking place in all of the different venues that research software engineering really has kind of advanced. But then that's not really what I want to talk about. Um, what I want to talk about is where are we going next and how do we define ourselves? So the biggest challenge I have always had during my career is trying to explain what it is that I do to other people. Um, I don't know how easy it is for you. I asked a lot of different people how they did describe themselves. And in most cases, it was something to do with writing code, probably. Yeah. So, so, so what is it that we do? Well, I kind of think that the problem is that different people perceive what a research software engineer is 
in different ways. Um, I might see myself as doing really valuable work, uh, collaborating with different people, making sure that uh, all of their requirements are understood and that I can translate this into something that will become a wonderful co-designed research project. Um, my collaborators might think I do magic. Uh, my friends all think all uh, I do is play games um, all day. But in reality, what do I do? I mostly just Google for answers. So, so is this what a research software engineer is? This is so 2010. Um, what we need to do, we are in 2023. And obviously, what have we got now that I can ask? I can ask ChatGPT. So what does a research software do in a typical day? And clearly, um, the world's greatest mansplainer uh, is here with the answers. Um, it's, it's, it's clear, you know, we're collaborating, we're optimizing. I'm sure there's loads of things here that you have seen uh, that you do every day. But is that what we do? Is it? Um, I think the real problem is that it's very easy to see some of the things that are common between all of our, our jobs and what our, our roles, our responsibilities. But maybe we need to look a little bit further because this isn't a great list of what an RSE is. The slide I showed beforehand isn't a great representation of an RSE. And why is that? Ooh, I'd want to go twice for chat GPT. So, what can we do to see what an RSE really is? So um, I can go and try and understand what a model RSE is, you know, what everyone should be aspiring to. Um, and I can, oh no, wait, sorry. I'm gonna go and use the International um, uh, Research Software Engineering Survey, and I'm gonna say what a modal RSE is. Uh, so this is, the, this is the average of what a research software engineering is as described by yourselves. Um, so this is everything that comes up as more than 50% of respondents on the International Research Software Engineering um, Survey. So you probably have a PhD, you probably work in the sciences, um, you probably came from the sciences and work at a university. You're almost certainly on a permanent contract, which is great. You use a whole set of tools, including Python, and a lot of people might kind of go, ooh, um, on, around that. You have an ORCID, you're a co-author, great. You're probably male and you're probably white. Um, you're almost certainly in a team with a bus factor of one. And you've been to an RSE conference. So this is, this is what a model, a model RSE looks like. But actually, if you, if you kind of like look around at what all of you all look like, and if you look at what we saw um, in, uh, in kind of like lots of different situations, um, that's not really necessarily who we all are. So this image is really interesting. This is probably the one image that encapsulates in the last 10 years um, what the public think of as being research software and research software engineering. So here's a question to you all. Um, hands up if you think that Dr. Katie um, uh, Bowman is an RSE. Hands up if you think Dr. Katie Bowman is not an RSE. Hands up if you think that we shouldn't be deciding for Dr. Katie Bowman if she is an RSE or not. Yeah, so this is it. So part of the problem here is that we're getting a label applied to us. And it is something that is, is quite difficult uh, to negotiate because on the one hand, what we're trying to do is we are trying to make sure that uh, the work we've done is being seen and recognized by everyone. And on the other hand, we're often being seen to have to fit into different boxes. And that is not who we are. Um, so with great apologies to my colleague, Simon Hetrick, this is one of his slides. I think the challenge here is that we've often tried to um, look at ourselves as being this thing that is in between research and software engineering. And the problem here is that this is just one axis. So we also have whether a research software engineer is in uh, a central RSC team or embedded, but then we also have the different types of RSCs and the work that they do. And then we have the different fields that they might work in. So RSEs are everywhere. I know that 50% are working in the sciences, but that means there's a lot of them working elsewhere. 
Um, all of the different things that RSEs do make research software engineering as a profession such a great place, such a diverse place, and such a vibrant community to be in. And I think that's it. You know, you can see this is the photo which we are going to be taking after this uh, from last year in Newcastle. And if you look around you and you look um, at the people that you're sitting next to, these are people you can learn from. These are people who have skills that are as different as the skills you share. So here are people that can really um, make the difference between the, the things that you do and the things that you learn. So please do, at the social tonight, talk to other people and find out what makes you different and what your different experiences are, as well as talking about the things that we've been talking about for 11 years now uh, around training and recognition and lack of support from our organizations that bring us together. But that's still not really what I want to talk about. Um, so one of the things that has been really great around the, the last few years is that there are a lot more opportunities for people to tell their own stories. So I have privilege here, standing here in front of you and going, here's my view of the world. Um, but now there's lots of opportunities for people to talk about what they're doing and to show the different ways in which they are RSEs. Um, I'm going to single out two particular places, um, developer stories um, and code for fort. Uh, and Peter Schmidt is in the audience who's uh, the host of Code for Fort, um, but also there are there are lots of initiatives coming up every day. Um, women in HPC uh, do a lot to kind of showcase different examples of people working in this area. And as you have seen on the RC Slack just now, there is the new RC Journeys as well that are, are looking for volunteers. So there are so many different ways now to be able to find out around all of the different ways that people are doing research software engineering. So here's a little kind of like interlude. This is the bit where uh, I take a little breath, I check how much time I have left, and I ask another question so that my voice doesn't give out. Um, so one of the things that's really interesting, I find, about the way that we perceive things is that everyone perceives things in different ways. So I'm going to do a quick test. When I say the word the future, do you think of that as going forward or going backward? So who thinks of the future as being something that goes forward? And who thinks of the future as something that goes backwards? Interesting. So a few people, and those people are probably of um, East Asian descent. So in, uh, in, in Mandarin, for instance, I do not speak Mandarin, but I've read a very good research paper that's done this analysis across a lot of languages. Um, in Mandarin, for instance, uh, we think about people stumbling backwards into the future because you can't see into the future, you can only see into the past. Um, and the way that we perceive things means that different people will have different viewpoints on, on what we look at. So what I was really interested in is trying to find other perspectives that might give me a more rounded view of what research software engineering should be doing. So here's one little thing. Um, so the reason I was here back in 2001 um, was because another part of what I do is in the arts. Um, and in this case, I was uh, being a film projectionist in the arts hall. Um, and, and so I get to talk to a lot of different people. And one of the people I talked to um, was a screenwriter called Andrea Gibb. And she, she posted this wonderful photo uh, about a year or so ago to give a sense of how other creative professions don't necessarily get uh, the recognition and the understanding of the work they do. Um, so on this picture here, what you see is three piles of notebooks. Um, and each of these notebooks effectively is a script that she has written. Um, it's a script that she's been paid for. Um, the pile on the left never made it to the screen. The pile in the middle are the ones that actually made it to screen. And the pile on the right are the ones that uh, are still going. They still, she still has hope for them. They are in the process. The thing that this reminded me of around what we do with research software engineering is that so much of the work that we do might be for things that never really see the light of day. 
Um, I, I was thinking back on all of the different software projects that I worked on and all of the different ways in which I might have worked on a piece of software which didn't really see the light of day. It either um, didn't get very many users or the funding stopped or for whatever reason, it didn't really um, end up being sustained and still used today. And I was thinking, that's okay, because the work that I did on all of those projects helped me improve the work on all of the stuff that was um, successful. And I think that's something that we need to kind of take as, as something to, to have hope in, um, is that really, when we think about the work that we do, we're not just thinking about the work that is successful, we're also thinking about the work that we do to hone our practice, to um, make sure that other things can come along that help pave the way for success later, to really understand why it is that we are doing things and why we are research software engineers. Um, another thing I was, I was looking at, and this is thanks to Emmy Sang, um, who some of you will know, uh, is, is trying to look and see how other industries and sectors consider the way that we sustain the development of uh, and the provision of different kinds of services. So in the uh, water sector, which is an incredibly vital um, sector for many, uh, for many different countries, places and people, they have this idea of three T's, tariffs, taxes and transfers. And so the idea is that uh, the supply of water is so important that uh, you can't really leave it to any one um, organization or individual or company or region to support. You need to work out what is the different mix of things that, uh, that ensures that everyone has access to a clean water supply. And so the way this works is you, you consider the tariffs, the things that people, um, the users themselves pay, uh, taxes, which are the subsidies um, from the government that uh, come from our taxes as individuals, and transfers, what we do uh, globally to make sure that uh, support is given from people who can afford it to people who, can need, who need it. And I've been wondering what that means for research software as well. So what is the equivalent for research software? Because we are in a little bit of a uh, crisis time for research software, not in as much as there isn't funding, that there aren't lots of great jobs, but in that we need to work out how to coordinate to ensure that people aren't missing out, to make sure that people always have access to the software they need. Because ultimately, as research software engineers, our aim is not to create the shiniest, greatest tool that's ever been produced. Um, it is, as Gail said in his talk this morning, it is to make sure that we can support the really important things that need to be done. We should not be technology focused or technology solution focused. We should be focused on understanding what it is that we need and what we can provide to improve the world. Um, so yeah, what, this, what, what does this look like for research software? So if, if the taxes are the things from the research councils um, and from philanthropic um, foundations uh, and transfers are things that can be done through things like open source projects and the sharing of effort, what are the tariffs here? So we know about licensing software and licensing fees, but then what other things can help balance out uh, the funding of software? Is it universities uh, chipping in? Is it, is it changing uh, to different types of subscription models and so on? So there are lots of things that could be done to help uh, improve the way that research software is being funded. But again, that's not really what I want to talk about because most of you can't do anything about that. And the one thing that I guess I have learned around this is is that uh, the things that are most impactful are the things that we can do ourselves. Um, and so what I really want to talk about is uh, understanding what are the sorts of things that as a set of individuals and projects and together, we can do with research software that will make things better for ourselves, our teams, other research software engineers, and the world in general. And so for this, I'm going to go to one last um, analogy. How many people have heard of the UN Sustainable Development Principles? Hmm. 
that's really good. So a lot of you will probably have, have heard about it because your university has put something into their research outcomes system that says, please tick which of these sustainable development principles your research falls into. But I, I find them really useful uh, because what they are, are a set of holistic principles that really say, um, to make sure that we have a better world in the future, um, we really do need to treat things uh, as being interconnected. Um, and that means both in terms of the goals that we strive for, and also in terms of the fact that we can't do this as individuals. So I wondered, um, and I've had discussions again with a lot of people in the Software Sustainability Institute and um, our fellows in particular, what, what happens if you try and do something similar for research software? Could we come up with a set of principles that we as the Software Sustainability Institute could apply to all of the work we did, um, that we could encourage our fellows and our collaborators to do, um, uh, that would really uh, understand the development of research software uh, as being multifaceted, so that you can't just focus on one particular area uh, before the other. Um, and also recognize the fact that we can't do this on our own. If only we did this, things would not change. But if everyone started doing it, would things change? So how could we make research software development better for all? And so um, this is the bit where I'm a little bit nervous because I've never really shown these to other people before. Uh, and I'm happy to kind of take um, questions and feedback on this. These are by no means the principles. They are what I think could be the starter principles. Um, here we go. So I think the first thing is to try and understand what it is that you can do in your, um, in your software development projects that help your own team. And I think there are three things that we're looking at here. So the first one, some people have mentioned, is to make your software findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And here in particular, I think reusability is the key because um, what we're trying to make sure is that as many people can reuse software in as many different forms as possible. And in some cases, um, that might just be by making the source code available with absolutely no maintenance. And in other cases, it might be about putting it into a container with lots of documentation so that people can just click a button and it runs. Um, I think it's about making things secure because one of the things that increasingly we are forgetting about is to understand that as research software engineers, we have a responsibility for the way that we write our software, in particular when it comes to software which is dealing with um, uh, personal data or areas where we might have very sensitive subjects. And to be honest now in research, almost everything is a sensitive subject. Um, and then the third thing is about maintenance. So can we make it easier for uh, other people to adapt our software and to make sure that uh, faults can be corrected? So those are three things I think are about helping your team. But we want to go further. So helping your team is great, but I'm sure you're doing all of this already, right? Yeah, who's, who's doing this already? I'm not. Um, uh, the next thing is around helping your peers. Uh, so helping your peers, helping other research software engineers. And this is really about understanding how we can write software in a way that makes it easier for everyone else to go about their day job. Um, so one thing is around being reproducible. And I think the main thing here is ensuring that other people trust in the research that is being enabled by the software you're writing. Because the big challenge that we have is not necessarily um, kind of uh, uh, yeah, it's not, it's not necessarily about persuading the general public that your software is technically robust or is, uh, it has uh, lots of unit tests, it has um, continuous integration. Really what the general public is asking is, can we trust that the software is giving the researchers the right answers? Um, and so we need to make sure that we can do that. Uh, we all know that we need to ensure that we are rewarding all the different roles, um, but I think that is also to make sure that we are developing the next generation. All of the people here who weren't um, alive when I, I started my last journey to Swansea. And I think importantly, and this is going back to, to the point I asked around whether we are looking forward or back to the future, 
we need to be inclusive. So we need to be accessible and supportive of a really broad community because as research software engineers, we need to make sure that we accept all of the different contributions into research software. And I think that was a really great point that Gail made earlier about uh, the difference between being right and being accepting of people's inputs. But we want to go further. And so this is the last, the last slide. How do we ensure that as research software engineers and through research software engineering, we can actually help the world and help society? And so these are the things that I think are the ones that we are, we are overlooking when we are focused on our projects and making sure that we do technically the best job. And maybe this is the place where we're going back into the politics and the being able to communicate and the being able to understand other people's uh, perceptions and what they think of when they think of us as a research software engineer. And so those things are to be responsible, um, and that's responsible in many different ways. Um, so to reduce our impact on the environment when we are designing code. Uh, I think it's I think it's really interesting. I was part of the, the net zero um, UKRI scoping project. And one of the things here is that we put a lot of emphasis, um, rightly so, on reducing the amount of um, uh, energy usage of our uh, of our large machines. Um, to make sure that we understand how we can reduce the impact of the hardware and how it's built. But we can also do this by making the software more efficient. If your software is robust and efficient, it will waste less energy. Um, and there's all sorts of responsibilities here. Um, it is great that we're able to be here uh, in person. It is also great that we've been able to do this conference so that people online can uh, can take part because there are all sorts of different responsibilities that we have to be aware of. Um, we want things to be open and global. Uh, so we, we appreciate that research is not really bounded by uh, things like disciplinary boundaries or funder boundaries or national boundaries. And so if we want to truly elevate research software engineering, what we also need to do is make sure that we are collaborating and making it possible for people everywhere to participate. And then the last one, and this is back to the argument that ChatGPT in particular has, has provided us with. We need to have our own faith in humanity, and we need to make sure that what we're doing recognizes that software is only a tool and the reason that we have tools is because humans are great tool users. So when we create software and we, um, we write research software, we have to remember that it is in service of us as humanity or the world in general. It is not in service of a few people who are there to try and ensure that we think in particular ways or we do things in particular ways. So how can we make sure that whenever we write software, it's unbiased, it's ethical and is supporting what we would all like to do, which is have a better planet for future generations. So these are nine principles. Are they the right ones? I don't know. Um, are they ones that I would subscribe to? I think so. And so I think what I would like to end on here is saying, um, this is a starting point. I think research software engineering is at a really interesting point in time. We're 11 years on from that first very sunny day in Oxford. We're now here on a very sunny evening in Swansea. And the question for you now is, where do we go from here? And so this has been my TED talk. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Neil. That was an excellent talk. Uh, so let's just go straight to the slide of questions. I think we've got about five or 10 minutes for questions. Uh, so on build to reduce impact on our environment, when, where to draw the line and decide not to build something? Yeah, that's that's a really good question, whoever's put that, put, put that in, because I think that's not just about a question that is relevant for the environment. It clearly is. It is also just a good question about uh, what's, what's a useful use of our time, um, because in many cases, the, the conscious decision to not build something um, 
because it won't be used or because it won't be useful is probably um, something that we should be doing more often. But the question here is when and where to draw the line. And I think here, part of the challenge is that we're not yet incentivized to uh, really look and see if someone else has been doing something and going, that's good enough. We tend to be incentivized to making something better. And so maybe the, the line is, um, is there something that's already doing it well enough that you can just reuse it? Yeah. Uh, I see the next question that's uh, shot at the list is uh, very good. What makes the principle specific to RSE rather than just general software engineering? Ah, um, good question. Um, so what, what makes the principle specific to RSE? I don't know that they are necessarily um, specific to RSE, but I cannot claim to be someone who is an expert in software engineering. So if you think they were, they're were they relevant to software engineering as well, and you are part of the software engineering community, um, please do uh, take it out there and say, see what they, they say, and um, let's talk. So. Uh, should we expect RSEs to sign up to a professional code of ethics, such as uh, the BCS has? Yeah, so... Um, I think this is a really interesting question because it also speaks to the different scales in which people do research software engineering as opposed to our RSEs. So you have people who are developing research software um, and will probably only do it once or twice for projects that they're directly involved in to people who are working with lots of different large projects for which there is a, uh, there is a large risk if they do things in an unethical way. Um, personally, I think it would be a good idea for there to be at least a voluntary code of ethics for research software engineering. And the question becomes, who is, who is the, the, the group that, uh, that leads on this and provides the infrastructure to do this? Is it the Society of RSE? Is it um, something else? So um, yeah, I would, I would definitely uh, believe that a voluntary code of ethics would be good. Yeah. Do you have an example of how using these principles would have led you to do something different in a project? Oh, excellent. I wish I'd prepared better for this one. Um, so, uh, yeah, so um, uh, I, I was for a long part of the 2000s, part of uh, a previous funding program that did a lot of different software development. It was, it was very, it was a very large funding program in the UK called the eScience program. And so I had the opportunity to work on a number of different research software projects. Um, and I think uh, one of the things that I would say when I was looking at the, the sort of things that are more in terms of the peers uh, and in terms of helping the world that we could have done better there. Uh, we did not really do well in terms of recognition. Um, so we, we kind of were good at recognizing the engineering contributions, but we were less good at recognizing the non-engineering contributions from research software engineers. Um, uh, another thing that I think I would do differently in terms of those projects um, in, uh, when we we're looking at the, the sort of wider aspect of things is um, in terms of being responsible. Uh, I think a big challenge here is understanding uh, the, and yeah, I, I guess it's, maybe I'll put this in humanist um, here, is I think there, uh, there, that we could have got this better in terms of understanding the different responsibilities that the people and the teams had and making sure that, uh, th uh, that we, we provided a good work-life balance for some of these projects. And I think this is something that is particularly prevalent in some areas of, the, of software engineering and programming in general. Uh, and I think it's something that I, I would definitely think we could do better on there. Yeah, the next one is, uh, the tricky thing about these principles is that they are not very actionable on the part of an RSC. If you ask an RSC if they want their software to be secure and maintainable, of course, yes. Mm -hmm. But do they have the time and resources currently? No. So how do we advance on these goals without further burden? Yeah. Um, I think here, uh, another, another really important thing is, uh, it is, it is thinking about what 
you can do with the time that you have available. So if you think about uh, maintainable, there are a number of different practices uh, around maintenance that save you time both immediately and in the future. So um, there's a lot of really great stuff that people have worked on. I see many people in the audience who've who've done um, some amazing work on giving guidance on documentation and what what small steps you can do around documentation that can make your software more maintainable. Um, around security, uh, there is likewise some very good uh, work that's being done, um, particularly in the US, about little checklists for, for at least understanding um, what you might have to worry about, even if you don't have the time to do this. So I think it is in many cases around understanding what what are the small things you can do to start getting into the habit of, of doing this. And then as these build up, you may be able to encourage people that you work with, the people who lead your projects, the people you fund your projects to do more. Okay, uh, agreed about the provocation that we should not label who are or aren't RSEs, but based on the inclusive principle, would you agree that the community society has a responsibility to offer examples of diverse roles exactly to encourage participation and broaden the modal? Uh, absolutely, yes. And I hope that the RSE journeys uh, will go towards that. So um, I speak to speak to the people who are involved in the society EDIA team. I, I don't um, have any direct connection with them, but I just had a little look at the site just before um, coming to coming down here to speak, and it, I think that's a good step in the right direction. Uh, the next one in the original notes, RSC was going to be part of the British Computer Society. Someone what's happened with that? Better eyesight than me because I couldn't read that even from from being over here. Uh, so, so it, uh, the BCS has been very supportive. Um, in particular, the BCS's policy unit ha has been grappling with uh, what the relationship is um, around this. So, I think there's uh, there's there's different things. So, on the one hand. Um, RSEs are increasingly becoming involved in the policy work that the BCS helps enable. And if you are, uh, even if you're not a member of the BCS, uh, they have opportunities for you to go into some of their working groups that help define uh, policy responses to different things. Um, and that might be really useful because one thing that the BCS has that perhaps the Society of RSE doesn't have just now is the direct connection to government and the civil service. Uh, and so, for instance, um, one of the things that I participated in recently was a rapid response to some of the, the things around the ethical use of AI. Um, so uh, there's, a, there's an opportunity there uh, for that. However, um, in terms of where we go and uh, with with how it was being described in those original notes, I think the big thing that was being discussed there is, uh, and this is maybe also around um, code of ethics and professional accreditation, is who decides what an RSE is. Um, and so, on the one hand, this talk that I've just given is no one decides who an RSE is. You decide that you're an RSE. But on the other hand, there is a question about whether. There is a sense of in the UK it would be a chartered RSE, or in other in other countries it might be a accredited or certified RSE, where you have agreed to a set of different um, principles that you abide by because you are you seek to be professionally recognised in that, and that's an interesting question that I think still needs to take place with the British Computer Society around um, who it is that says. Uh, an RSE is a chartered RSE. Uh, and with that, we're out of time. So I'd like to thank the audience for some excellent questions and thank Neil again for an excellent talk and excellent answers. Thank you.